Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, is there any question from the last lecture? None at all. So, like I okay. said last time, it okay. would be great if you could you know, cover uh, the portion that you covered in the last time. The last time. The last time. In uh, short. Uh, which bit? The the so deep I, water uh, formation. I told you that uh, your screen was lagging behind your voice. That's why uh -huh. some of us had a bit. Okay. Okay. Let's get started today. Okay. First of all, happy new year to everyone, and I'll keep this one short for your sanity. Let's take out the last lecture. Where should I get started from? Somewhere around here, or do you want me to get started somewhere around properties of water? Anyone? You want to give me some uh, pointers about where to get started from? Yeah, you can start from properties of water. Properties of water. OK. Let's... OK, let's cover the deep ocean circulation quickly. OK. The idea is that there is a density driven circulation system that's running along the planet. There are two places where we have deep water formation. The deep water, which bathes the abyssal plains of the ocean, are uh, formed in the northern Atlantic and all around Antarctica. And why is this important? In terms of global water flow, we are looking at a flow of uh, equivalent to 80 Amazonian rivers, which is almost eight times the total river flux of water that go is going to the oceans from continents. So it's a huge mechanism of water moving along the ocean basins. And this is where the carbon hides during glacial interglacial cycles. We're going to cover that in later lectures. So that's why this is a very important aspect of global climate. The speed of this circulation controls how much carbon you can store in the deep ocean, because eventually the water is being upwelled in places like North Pacific, uh, North Indian Ocean, sometimes along the coastal boundaries due to wind driven upwelling. And this process essentially keeps the, the CO2 from the atmosphere locked up as organic matter or respired organic matter in the deep ocean. So this is where it is of paramount importance. Now the idea of forming a dense water mass is very simple. All you need to do is change either the salt content of the water or the temperature of the water. You increase the salt content, it becomes denser, or you increase uh, or you lower the temperature, it becomes denser. We know that evaporation is a process by which you can evaporate a parcel of uh, water. And since it's a uh, solution which is not eutectic in nature, so the salt will remain behind and the water molecules will leave the system. As a process, you're going to increase the salinity of the water parcel. Now, if you can manage to evaporate some moisture out of a water parcel along equator and then transport the water parcel towards the pole and cool it down, so you'll form a very highly dense parcel of water. Now, water as a polar protic solvent, we are all familiar with it. It has a permanent dipole moment. However, the key aspect of this uh, systematics of thermal line circulation is that when we form ice, the crystal structure of ice doesn't allow for 
any dissolved ions to be present in there, or maybe in a trace trace quantity. I shouldn't say any. It should be in a very trace quantity. As a result, when you form ice from seawater, you're going to push all the salt that is dissolved in seawater out of solution into solid state. And it cannot go into forming crystalline salts if it has a layer of water lying right underneath it. So when you form sea ice, the, the salt is extruded out. It's known as salting out and the, it gets dissolved in the underlying water and forming a much denser water mass. You don't need to spend much time on it. You're quite familiar with this kind of properties of uh, water, which is a, essentially a function of its uh, strong hydrogen bonding with high boiling point, high specific heat capacity. And keep in mind, the maximum density of pure water is at 4 degrees Celsius. Now, in terms of boiling point of water, we know that for all the group 16 elements, from tellurium to selenium, sulfur to oxygen. This should have been the curve of molecular mass to boiling point relationship. However, water is lying way above the expected line because of its strong hydrogen bonding. The seawater contains a lot of salt. Among the dissolved salts, chlorine is of the highest concentration. Next comes sodium followed by magnesium, sulfur, sulfur in the form of sulfate, calcium, potassium, carbonate, bicarbonate, and a bunch of them. Now, all of these salts, some of these salts are known as conservative salts. What do I mean by a conservative salt? A salt which, or a conservative ion to be specific, not salt. An ion that does, does not participate in biology. Okay, so, by taking a parcel of seawater, if I can evaporate some amount of water out of it, I'm going to change its salinity. By salinity, I mean the amount of dissolved salts in it. And such high concentration of salt allows us for um, changing the density of the water parcel by evaporating small amounts of vapor out of it. And all you need to do is change it by a small amount to ensure that there is a density inversion. And we know but a fundamental physics dictates that there cannot be a density inversion in a horizontal structure. As soon as there is a density inversion, the structure is unstable and it's going to try and move towards the systematics where the densest water, water parcel is sitting at the bottom and the less dense one is at the top. Now, one of the unique property of seawater is the electrostriction. Essentially, the volume of seawater shrinks when you, well, volume of water or any polar protic solvent shrinks when you add a polar um, ionic salt to it. And this is kind of manifested in seawater very strongly because you have not only monovalent uh, ions dissolved in it, you have also divalent ions dissolved in it. And you can review this part of the lecture, and if you have any questions, you can get back to me. Now, we have already covered this. When ice forms, salt is extruded out of it. So there is no space for salt in ice. We'll try now to get to the idea of salinity. Salinity is a measure of amount of salt dissolved in seawater. Determination of seawater salinity through simple evaporation is not possible. Why isn't it possible? because a lot of these precipitating salts will have water of hydration. Now, if you want to drive the water of hydration out, what will happen is some of the carbonate salts is going to spontaneously dissociate into oxide and carbon dioxide. And as a gas, carbon dioxide is going to escape the system. So in a way, if you just dry down a parcel of seawater and then try and evaporate all remaining water molecules from the system, you will not get to the salinity value. So for years, scientists have been trying to get to the salinity. It started with the, the simple gravimetric method of evaporating stuff. And people understood that the chlorine concentration and salinity are very tightly correlated because dissolved chlorine is a very unreactive ion. And so it doesn't want to participate in chemical reactions. So the only way that chlorinity or the chlorine concentration of the 
sea water changes is when you change salinity that is through dilution with fresh water or evaporation of water due to uh, from sunlight now Kunzen in 1902 came up with the relationship between salinity and chlorinity in this form. However, then came the definition where you titrated the seawater using a silver solution where you can measure the chlorine, bromine, fluorine, and iodine concentration. Modern day, we use the practical salinity unit for all, all measurements that we do in the lab. This has nothing to do with measuring the directly the salt content of seawater. This has to do with electrical conductivity, and we compare it with a KCL solution, a potassium chloride solution, uh, which is at 15 degrees Celsius. Why potassium chloride? Because it ionizes 100%. So we use a, a salt that undergoes 100% ionization. And salinity can be expressed as a function of this. Okay. Now, the key feature of a, of a solution is that, well, the... The properties of a solution are different from that of the solvent. We are quite familiar with that concept. These are uh, known as colligative properties. What we have here is the salinity of a water parcel. Well, you can take it as seawater plotted from 0 to 40 and the temperature in degrees Celsius. The, the bottom line gives you the freezing point of this uh, solutions, of the different solutions of salinity. And this is the line which gives you the temperature of maximum density. As expected, at zero salinity, the freezing point is zero degrees Celsius, and the temperature of maximum density is four degrees Celsius. As salinity increases, the, the freezing point keeps decreasing. Well, this is known as, we have already uh, seen this phenomenon in the form of depression of freezing point and elevation of boiling point for any solution. Whereas the temperature of maximum density starts collapsing, we are no longer forming the, the most, uh, what do you call it, concentrated, most dense parcel of water at four degrees Celsius. What is the implication of it? The implication of it is in this form. When we look at the density of seawater in the top graph, where the left hand y axis is giving you the density values in kilograms per meter cube. In the bottom one, we are looking at the freshwater system with the same y axis. And on the x axis, we have temperature going from minus 2 degrees Celsius to 34 degrees Celsius. We see that the seawater doesn't have a temperature of maximum density, as opposed to freshwater, which is a maximum density of at 4 degrees Celsius. To keep in mind that seawater freezes at a temperature of minus 1.98 degrees Celsius, and that is the temperature of its maximum density. So for seawater, right before it freezes, it's at maximum density. Now, the density of seawater is expressed as the following function. Okay, without going into the details of it, it's a complex function of temperature and salinity. It's nothing but linear. Okay, and how is that manifested? If we plot the water parcels in a temperature salinity uh, grid and parcels of same density will have contours which are not linear. What is the implication of it? The implication of it is that two water parcels of different temperature and salinity can have the same density. Okay like A and B. Water parcel at A has a temperature of around 0 degrees Celsius and a around 34.2. Whereas the water parcel at B has a temperature of around 9 degrees Celsius and a salinity of around 35.6. They do have the same exact density. Now, if I mix these two water parcels, what happens? Both temperature and salinity are conservative properties. So when two water parcels are mixed, the resultant temperature and salinity is a reflection of the proportion of their mixing. Okay, if I mix one liter of water at five degrees Celsius with one liter of water at 50 degrees Celsius, it's going to be nothing but five plus 50 divided by two. Okay, so in that case, the resulting water mass is going to follow this linear mixing line between the two. And since 
the isopic or the equal density lines are curving in nature all the time when you mix two water bodies of the same density but different temperature and salinity you form a water mass which is of higher density than the initial water masses and the mixture will sink and find the layer which has the same density now what happens on the globe is that close to the equator we are evaporating the water making it more saline however we are also increasing its temperature salinity rise leads to a rise in density increase in temperature leads to a drop in density so around the equator you don't find very dense water masses now as the water moves towards the pole along the surface of the ocean heat is stripped off and as a result it becomes denser and denser at the pole it's the densest so it sinks to the bottom of the ocean so essentially much of the deep ocean in, is based in water mass that is of temperature close to 2 degrees celsius okay and this is nothing but the planets attempt to bring it to a thermal equilibrium at the equator you have high temperature at the poles you have low temperature so if you move a warm parcel of water from the equator to the pole you are transporting heat from the equator to the pole and if you move a cool parcel of water from the pole to the equator whereas the thermal gradient is the opposite you are also moving heat from the equator to the pole so the entire thermal line circulation is working on the principle that we are trying to move heat from the equator to the pole and bring the planet to a thermal equilibrium this is a classical picture of the gulf stream or the stream that flows through the gulf of mexico through the straits of cuba towards the north atlantic and this is transporting a large amount of heat to western europe and keeping western europe habitable and this parcel of water since it's really warm and passing through uh, 30 degrees north which we know is a strongly evaporative zone acquires a very high salinity as it moves towards the pole it loses its heat it becomes warm and it sinks and this is known is some component of the north atlantic deep water so there are two deep water formation sites the north atlantic seen here and the north and the all around the antarctica seen here so this is known as the north atlantic deep water and everything around antarctica is the antarctic bottom water so if we look at the temperature profile of the planet this is what it looks like as expected equator is warm the poles are cool okay then comes ah let's look at this this strange feature here in the north atlantic you are moving the gulf stream is transporting heat to us the western europe as you can see the sea surface temperature contours is biased to us the western europe it's not dropping down to sub zero temperature at the same latitude in western part of europe than in uh, the no. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can you please use the pointer? Your cursor is um, almost mixing with the background, so we cannot see it. Properly. Is this a pointer? Where is the pointer? So, uh, in yeah, yeah, you'll have the laser pointer there. Oh, brilliant. Actually, uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's still lagging for me. Uh, Shukri, is it lagging for you? Like uh, when you went to the next slide? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's lagging for me as well. Like. Okay, what yeah. I will do is I will. Uh, what is the time gap? Like five seconds? I think it's around four to five seconds. Four to five seconds. So when I change a slide, I'll give a pause. Okay. I think. But that's... I think uh, it's in general. Uh, your, you know, your screen is lagging about four five seconds behind your voice. Oh. So when you will be moving your cursor and you will be speaking about the place where you are hovering your cursor, your cursor won't be there for us to see over there. Damn, but yeah. first tell me how do I get to a cursor, uh, a laser? How do you point something? Is this the deep ocean circulation temperature profile clearly visible? Yeah, it is. Okay, so everything I have said till now 
was that clear or do I need to repeat any of it? Well, it was not in sync. That's oh, what. damn. Yeah. OK, I, uh, I need a faster Internet connection. My apologies. OK. Um, how best do we do it? OK, let's try and move forward. If if there is any lag in any particular site, OK, just interrupt me, OK? Don't feel shy about it. Interrupt me. Don't let me go through the lecture without you catching up, OK? And I'll slow down so that we can go, like cover a, a bit of these things, OK? Now, the key feature, if you observe the Atlantic Ocean and observe the North Atlantic Ocean, what you will see is that these lines, the solid black lines, are the, the lines of the same temperature. And as expected, around the equator, we have high temperature. And as we move towards the pole, the temperature drops. But the key difference between Eastern Atlantic and the Western Atlantic, Eastern Atlantic is the one that is butting the, the African continent and Western Europe. And the Western Atlantic, obviously, is North America. As we saw that the Gulf Stream is transporting heat from the equator towards the polar region, and it follows the, the northern North American boundary till up to Florida, end of Florida, and then peels off North America and starts transporting heat towards Western Europe. What we see is that the temperature contours in North Atlantic are biased. On the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean, there is a lot more warmer water towards the pole. On the western side of the Atlantic Ocean, there is a lot less transport of heat and there is a lot cooler temperature. Is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. OK, that, that the manifestation of it is in your weather. Not in your climate, but in you know, weather. OK, if you go to say some place in Italy, say Milan, or even lower than that, a place in Italy, Rome. Rome's equivalent in North America is New York. Rome might get an inch of snow per year. New York will get 10 meters of snow per year. That is the difference. Because the transport of heat is biased towards Western Europe. So the polar front of cold wave can come down all across North, Northern America and cause freezing cold temperature. OK. Next slide. I hope it's visible now. Stop me if it's not. Yeah, it just did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Yeah. So this again is a structure of the salinity it, across the globe. And we are all looking at surface ocean salinity. The last figure was the surface ocean temperature. As expected, salinity is high, around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Around the equator, we have high temperature, but not high salinity. Why not high salinity? Because evaporation happens around the equator, but the re-precipitation also happens around the equator. Please note some of the key features. Western boundary of Africa, Congo River. Around the equator, you can see the Congo River, the green patch in Africa. And right outside in the, the eastern part of the Atlantic Ocean or the equatorial Atlantic or southern equatorial Atlantic, whatever you want to call it, you can see blue bobs, which is very low salinity. Why do we have such low salinities around that part? Because Congo is one of, one of the rivers which crosses the equator twice. So the amount of fresh water that's been dumped into the ocean is really, really huge. So it's diluting the fresh water, uh, the seawater with fresh water and the salinity is lower. Similar features are observed in Bay of Bengal. Bay of Bengal is nothing but a blue patch. We have major rivers in the form of Ganga, Brahmaputra, Mekong, Irawardi, all bringing freshwater flux to Bay of Bengal. Same latitude, opposite side of India, Arabian Sea. 
much, much higher salinity because we don't have many major rivers flowing towards the western boundary of India. And also there is the uh, Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is a narrow enclosed ocean which is lying at 30 degrees north, which is in the bang in the middle of the dry zone. So you have large amount of sunlight coming in, lot of evaporation, close to zero precipitation. You can reach salinities up to 42. So in open ocean, that is one of the places where you have the maximum salinity is the Persian Gulf. And the overflow from the Persian Gulf will cause a large increase in salinity in the Arabian Sea. You can see that the, the salinity structure looks like this. Now, you give it a gap. OK. The salinity so, and temperature. Yes, go ahead. Um, could you again please use a pointer? It's kind of really hard to follow the cursor because of the color difference. I wasn't using it. Uh, how the hell do I use the pointer? Which yeah, you see the laser point. pointer ah, option. Yeah, brilliant. thank you. Laser color should be which green? No, red is better, right? Yes, sir. OK. The combination of salinity and temperature brings us to density. From this particular snapshot, it's quite clear the zones of maximum density is North Atlantic and all around Antarctica. And basic physics, the denser the water, the lower it's going to sink. And as we are forming the densest water at the poles, we can expect that water parcel is going to be very, very cold. OK, now this is what we observe. OK, I'm going to give it a half a second break. This is what we observe in terms of the thermohaline circulation. OK, if there is anything on the planet which controls climate uh, and the temperature of the globe, it is thermohaline circulation. What we observe here is the Gulf Stream bringing heat laden water surface current to the poles. The heat is released. It sinks. The blue lines denote circulation that's happening along the bottom of the ocean. The red line denotes circulation that's happening along the surface of the ocean. And that is transported from the North Atlantic to the South Atlantic. Around Antarctica, there is a recharge with Antarctic deep water formation. And that essentially forms the entire thermohaline circulation. There are two major upwelling zones. One is in the North Indian Ocean and the other one is in the North Pacific Ocean. So remember the North Pacific Ocean is the primary upwelling zone of the thermohaline circulation. Is the new graph visible to everyone? Yes, sir. So this brings us to the concept of potential temperature. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go back to uh, today's lecture a bit because Before I delve deeper into potential temperature, I just want to give you guys an idea of what to expect. Laser pointer visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Just look at the surface ocean temperature across from equator towards the pole, right? We can see there is a temperature gradient and the boundary of the uh, ocean has a different temperature. West, eastern boundary has a lot warmer temperatures. Western boundary has a lot higher temperature. This is to do with the surface ocean current. That brings us to how different latitudes will have different water column temperature structure. What we are looking at here is depth going from 0 to 1600 meters. The left hand panel gives you low latitude, which is something close to the equator. The mid latitudes close to 30 degrees north and the high latitudes around 60 degrees north and above. 
at the low latitude, we have pretty high temperatures at the surface, and this temperature has a pretty large depth. This high temperature de definitely is due to warming of uh, caused by sunlight, and there is wave action to mix it up. So there you have a large mixed layer in the surface ocean. After that, there is a sharp gradient and there is a shallow gradient. This gradient is known as the thermocline. Thermocline is essentially any depth where DTTZ is greater than zero. Okay. There are rare cases where DTTZ can be less than zero. We will cover that for high latitude cases. But normally, 90% 90, 90 of the ocean, anywhere where DTTZ is greater than zero is a thermocline. So this thermocline prevents an inversion of water column across the globe. Only in places where you can form water masses in the surface, which have density higher than the water masses in the deep, can you form, make it sink. So this is the low latitude. Not much of a seasonal difference, pretty much fixed thermocline, nothing changes. When you get to mid latitudes, there's a large difference in temperature between summer and winter. So in winter, you have a very shallow thermocline. In summer, you have a very deep thermocline. Whereas if you get to the high latitude, you can have a dichothermal layer. What is a dichothermal layer? The surface water starts getting cooler and cooler. And we know that the freezing point is around minus 1 980 degrees Celsius. Okay. So you can form really cold, really dense water masses, which sinks to a, a depth which is below the surface, but and is cooler than the surface water. So in high latitude, we can have a DTDZ greater than zero and you can have a DTDZ less than zero in the same water color. But this usually happens at a much shallower water depth. Now, if we look at the growth and decay of a thermocline in northern hemisphere and mid latitude, what we can see is that, let me just make this graph a bit smaller. Otherwise, it's not visible. Ah. Is this visible? Yeah, it should be visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What we have here is depth in the water column, left and y axis. And in oceanography, we always put depth going from zero to positive, okay, as we go down. Uh, our reference frame is sea surface. Rather than going up, we are going down. And the temperature in degrees Celsius. The key feature is how the thermocline changes from one season to the other. If we sit at, let's start with the midsummer. Midsummer is our August. August, August, we have a mixed layer and a very steep thermocline which goes all the way down to around 2 to 3 degrees Celsius temperature. As we go to September, the, therm the, the sea surface temperature decreases. The depth of the thermocline also becomes shallower. The mixed layer becomes deeper. September to November, November to January. We are moving all the way to the left, okay? Then comes March. Why isn't January the coolest month compared to the March? Why, why am I getting the lowest temperature in March rather than in January? Because it's during February that everything reaches its lowest possible temperature in Northern Hemisphere. It's not in January, okay? The further north you move, the more shift in the season you get. And the cooling starts, obviously, the, the shortest day of the year is 23rd of December. But beyond that to middle of March is the coldest period. And around middle of February, early March, you hit the coldest period of time in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's what we are observing in this system. And beyond March, we see the warming and the mixed layer becoming shallower and shallower. Keep that in mind. What this is telling you is that in oceanography, not only the ocean basins are different, the seasons are different, and within the same basin, the eastern side and the western side are different. So it's a very dynamic system. 
Now, once we take a porter parcel and sink it, for all practical purposes, we consider water to be an incompressible liquid. But when you start sinking water masses to great depths, it undergoes a slight amount of compression. And as expected, when you do work on a system, the temperature of the system has to go up. So in oceanography, what we have, the concept of potential temperature or adiabatic temperature. It is kind of defined as a temperature of water after it has been corrected for the adiabatic effect. What we have here it is a depth versus temperature profile. The depth goes from zero to around 12 kilometers. We are looking at the maximum depth around 10 kilometers. Maximum attainable depth is the Mariana Trench around 11.8 or 9 kilometers. In the open circle are the in situ temperature. So if you put a thermometer at that depth, that is the temperature you will get. And what you can see is that beyond 3000 meters, there is an inversion of temperature which is not possible because there is not much heat exchange going on. So why is there an inversion of temperature? It's nothing but the effect of the work that we are doing on the system. OK, but if we correct that potential, that in situ temperature to potential temperature, we get to potential temperature, which shows that the actual potential temperature is going down. What does that mean? If we take a seawater sample, of say salinity 35 and temperature starting at 5 degrees Celsius and lower it to 400 meters adiabatically. Essentially, there is no exchange of heat between the that parcel of water and the surrounding seawater. Its temperature is going to increase by almost 10 percent or 9 percent, reach around 5.5 degrees Celsius. So that half a degree Celsius increase in temperature is your uh, adiabatic warming of the system. OK, now we can use this potential temperature to understand the deep water formation. This is a transect. OK, let's hang on for a few seconds. This is a plot of potential temperature in the North Atlantic. Well, in the entire Atlantic basin, we are going from 60 degrees south to around 70 degrees north. This is the transect along which the data is taken. OK, you're going from Iceland to all the way up to Antarctic shell, A16. And the color contour is giving you the potential temperature of the waters that's present there. On this side, we have the North Atlantic deep water formation. On this side, we have the Antarctic bottom water formation. First thing to observe is that the Antarctic bottom water is at much lower temperature than the North Atlantic deep water. The potential temperature of Antarctic bottom water is lower than the North Atlantic deep water. And the equatorial sill kind of stops the Antarctic bottom water to spill over to the North Atlantic. So how does the North Atlantic deep water will compare against the Antarctic bottom water. For the North Atlantic deep water, salinity is the major driving force because you have the Gulf Stream, which is losing a lot of heat. Then you have the Mediterranean outflow, which is also highly saline water. So your salinity is really high. Salinity is around 38 PSU. And then you cool it a bit, you're going to sink very rapidly. Whereas the Antarctic bottom water, obviously we 